Good morning. This is November 12th, 2002, and we're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and we're privileged to have with us today Melvin Davis. Mel, welcome to the library, and thank you for coming in today. May I ask you first when you were born? I was born on September 6, 1917. And immediately, with my mathematical genius, I figure that makes you 85 years old. That is correct. And thank you again for coming in. Where were you born, Mel? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. And your current address? Is it Lexington, Massachusetts? And, and your marital status? I am a widower. A widower. Do you have children, Mel? Yes, I have three children. I think you, you have a daughter, is that correct? And My first child was a daughter. Her name was Sherry Judith. My son's name is Richmond Gray. And my youngest daughter is Allison M. Allison M. Thank you. Mel, when and where did you enter the military service? I entered the military, uh, my military service on You're like me, you have to put on glasses for the fine print. On May 21, 1941. 1941? Yes. The, the United States, Mel, at that time was not at war. Why did you enter the military in May? Because I was inducted. Were, were you drafted into I the service? I was dra drafted into the service. And uh, where, where, where did this happen? Where were you when you were inducted? I was in the armory in Boston, which was a National Guard armory. Did you have any choice as, as to what branch of service you would go into? No, I did not. So which one did you go, go into? the United States Army. You were inducted into the Army in early of 1941. Yes. Were any of your friends or uh, schoolmates taken into the service at the same time? There were other young men from my town of Medford, but they were not my close acquaintances or friends. So you pretty much went in on your own, all by yourself. Yes. After the armory and uh, being sworn in, I guess, um, where did the army take you or send you? They took me to Camp Edwards. Camp Edwards? On Cape Cod. Down on the Cape. And is that where you had your basic training? Yes, I received three months of basic training. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You were a civilian. Uh, what had been your schooling up to that time? Well, I had graduated from high school, and I had attended Boston University Evening Division for two and one half years, so that I had two and a half years of college in addition to my high school education. What had been your major, that is, what, what was your interest in life at that particular time? Well, my major in high school was a technical course. Uh, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and other English, Latin. And what about at Boston University? At Boston University, it was simply a uh, 
fine arts course that I followed. Yeah. Okay, so after two and a half years of that, uh, you, you're taken into the Army, and did the Army um, give you any tests to decide what they were going to do with you? I can't remember that they did. And after, after uh, basic training, what was your assignment? Well, after basic training, we immediately went on maneuvers down to North Carolina. And that was camping out in the fields in North Carolina. And I, that continued until we returned to Camp Edwards on November 7th. 1941, which was Pearl Harbor Day. December 7th. Uh, De December yeah. 7th. Uh, that's a very historic date, and suddenly you're in a war. Was the work you did down in North Carolina, was this infantry training? Yes, it was infantry training. And what particularly did you do? Rifle, machine gun? Um, As I remember, uh, it was rifle I know. I was in a Company D, which was an infantry company for heavy weapons. The armament was 50 caliber machine guns. And you had a, a rifle? I had a rifle. Was this an M1? M1 rifle. Garand rifle? Yes. Can you tell us where you were um, on December 7, 1941, where you heard the news of what had happened? Yes, we had just returned to Camp Edwards, and that was on the radio, and we heard the announcement and uh, we realized that we were about to go to war, our country having been attacked on that day. What was your reaction to that? Well, it was acceptance of it, and I didn't, I don't believe that I reacted in any definitive way. It was not anything that I could change, and so I accepted it. And I knew that, in all probability, I was to go to war because I was trained in basic training and further trained uh, when we were in North Carolina and having come back to the uh, Camp Edwards where we were based, mm -hmm. I felt that we would become engaged in the war. That the following day, the President of the United States uh, made his speech, Declaration of War. Did you folks sit down and listen to that? I'm not sure whether I heard it on that day, but I have seen and heard it's his been speech repeated several many times, times repeated yeah. later. So what did the Army do with you and the fellows you were with? Were you serving now? as a member of a platoon or a company? I was serving as a member of a company. Uh, I believe I had made private first class at about that time. Uh, on January 12th, I had been sent to Brooklyn, New York, and I was in the barracks at Brooklyn, New York, awaiting the troop transport that I was to embark upon, having removed the cooking ranges that were in the ship and installing large vats so that 
food could be steamed hot at breakfast time and steamed hot at evening time. They were converting these ships into they were troop transports. They were converting the yeah. ships into troop transports. Were you with a, a, another, uh, how many men were with you in, in Brooklyn? Well, there were enough men in Brooklyn to fill There were four ships in our convoy. There were four ships to be filled. And I was on the ship that was named SS Argentina that was serving the New York to Argentina in return travelers prior to the war. So, okay, I see why it was converted then. There's four ships, and did you have any idea where you would be sent or where you might go? Well, when we left Brooklyn, we sailed south. We went by Cape Hatteras in very rough weather, and we continued on south and into the Caribbean Sea and we all knew that we were heading for the Panama Canal. Logically then, You're going didn't the into the Pacific. Yeah. And we did begin to head north-northwest, and it was announced over the ship's system that we were heading to reinforce General MacArthur in the Philippines. A couple of days later, the course of the ship began to be south-southwest. And we knew that we had changed course, and they immediately announced on the uh, intercom that we were heading south-southwest for Australia. And we did eventually arrive in Sydney, Australia. Did you stop any place along the way? No, we did not. So from New York to Australia, how many days? 30 days, something quite like a, that? Quite a few. I don't believe it was 30, but it was some, some days. Had, is this your first time on a ship? Yes, yes. That's an awfully long voyage for your first time. And now um, you went to Sydney, Australia, went to Sydney. and what happened then? Well, when we uh, tied up to the wharf at Sydney, Australia, there was a railroad track there and a train was waiting. We disembarked onto the train and we rode about four or six miles outside of the city of Sydney where there was an Anzac military camp. and we. Uh, left uh, the train and we went into barracks that were there. Just uh, as, an, as a side comment, when we left the ship we had two sandwiches with us. One was cheese and one was beef. I usually like to save the good sandwich for later, so I ate my cheese sandwich. Most of the boys ate their meat sandwich, and unfortunately it was tainted. They got very, very sick. They came out of the barracks that we were in, and they were flopping on the ground, vomiting, and they were extremely uncomfortable. There was about 10 or 12 of us that didn't eat the meat, and we tried to attend to them as well as we could but that was an unfortunate experience. That was your introduction to Australia? That's when I was introduced to Australia. What did you do at this particular camp now? Further training or what happened? No, we did not have any further training. We, uh, we left Australia and we began to go north uh, toward the Solomons. Okay, let's, let's 
uh, put this in sequence here. Tell us about leaving Australia. Did you leave from the port of Sydney? We left from the port of Sydney. In incidentally, when we arrived in the port of Sydney, the Enterprise aircraft carrier, which I think was the only one in the Pacific Ocean, had a big hole in its, in its prow. And we found out later that it had left there and gone to Pearl Harbor to have it repaired. And then it went back to sea again after having been repaired. But that was something I learned about that ship later. Let, let's, let's get some time uh, sequence here. Um, how long were you at this particular camp? You, you don't have to be that specific, Mel. Was it a matter of weeks or months? It was a couple of months, I think. No. So I arrived in Australia. I arrived in Australia the 26th of February, 1942, and I left Australia the 6th of May, no, the 6th of March, 1942. So it was just a very few days. All right, can you tell us about the, when, the new ship? Was it as big as the other one, or did you go as... Uh, a group of four ships, or there, there how many? A, there was a group of. There was a group of four ships going across the the Pacific. But when you left Sydney, uh, the. Um, when I left Sydney. How big a convoy was it then? There was only one ship. I left Sydney on the 6th of March, and I arrived in New Caledonia on the 12th of May. That's, that's quite a journey. That, that's, uh, that's a month on the ship. Did you stop any place? No, it was from the 6th of March to the 12th of March. It was only six days. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell us what you did in New Caledonia then, Mel. Well, we were... We landed at Nomea, which is the southern tip of New Caledonia. And our... regiment moved up the island approximately 40 miles. It was a two-day march, and we arrived at a beach that we anticipated the Japanese may try to land at, and we took up positions on a small little hill above the beach we had an encampment there, and uh, we did have soldiers patrolling the beach, watching for any approach of any Japanese ships that might be attacking. None of them did attack. But you dug in in a, a defensive perimeter to defend that particular beach? Yes, we took up. I don't, I don't think, I don't remember digging in, but, yeah. we, but we took up positions at the beach, nearby the beach. Did you have any armor with you, any uh, accompany tanks or anything no, like that? No, we did not have any tanks, it was strictly infantry. Infantry with uh, your heaviest weapons being 50 caliber machine guns? That's the only, that the only weapons we had. And how long did you stay at this particular place? Uh, We 
left, we left New Caledonia on the 9th of Well, again, Mal, were, yeah. were you there as, as, as weeks or months? Just weeks. Okay. So maybe no, we're... No, no. We stayed on New Caledonia for longer than that, so I think September... September of 42? September of 42. And what happened then? Uh, did you uh, told you were told that you were going to ship out and go somewhere else? We left. We left New Caledonia, and then we arrived on Guadalcanal the twelfth of November. The twelfth of November. Okay, let's put this in perspective. The invasion of Guadalcanal was August, first week of August in forty-two and you arrived in November. What was it like when you arrived there? Can you describe it for us? When we arrived at, in, in New Caledonia? No, no Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal, yes. The what did you see when your ship uh, pulled up to a dock or whatever? Well, there was no dock. We pulled up and we landed on landing craft. And we went up, halfway up a hill. And that evening there began quite a large naval battle. And there were shells that missed their mark completely that were landing on the hill that we were, uh, we were in foxholes, foxholes that were previously dug by the Marines who had fortified that area at one time and then they pulled back to another area where they were in the process of building an airport. But the shells that were going astray from the naval battle all landed above us on the hill and I don't believe there were any of our any soldiers that were injured or killed. However, the Navy lost a lot of ships. They lost some ships there, and they lost some Navy personnel there. And I believe that Navy personnel did land on the island because when I was evacuated from Guadalcanal, I went aboard a ship that was carrying these Navy Right. Men that lost their ships would you, at the battle. Would you, could you tell us where you were in relationship to Henderson Field? Were you, could you see the field from where you were? No, we were quite a distance from Henderson Field. That was uh, at one end, that was at the southern end of the uh, island of Guadalcanal, which is a long, narrow island. We were about halfway up the island. Uh, at the beachhead where this naval battle took place. In addition to the shells that were strays from the naval battle, uh, in your position were you also under bombardment from aircraft? Did you get bombed at night or uh, at mm -hmm. any other time? No, we did not. We did not get bombed at, bombed at night. I don't recall any enemy aircraft coming over. What were your duties in this particular place? Well, I was in the infantry, as I said, I was in a heavy weapons company, and we simply took up defensive positions uh, along in a coconut grove 
which was there. Uh, England had Lever Brothers in England had a plan to have a coconut plantation along the shores of Guadalcanal where they grew coconut palms and from the coconuts they extract the meat and they use that in uh, producing soap. And that was the area that we were entrenched in. It was a coconut grove. When uh, you were there, Mel, where did you get, how did you get your news as to, uh, for example, where the Japanese positions were or uh, if a force was coming against you, how did you find out what was going on? Well, when we landed, we had four ships in our, uh, that arrived in Guadalcanal to discharge soldiers. There was a promontory that extended out from the, the island of Guadalcanal and around the end of that promontory on the day that we were landing came four Japanese troop transports. Their ships were a little bit smaller than ours, we could see, but we felt sure there were quite a few Japanese soldiers on there. And as a matter of fact, those were the soldiers that confronted us, and we confronted them. So they the, did land? They did land. And did, did they take up positions they near took, you? They took up positions ahead of us, and we were facing each other when the, uh, when the action on the island began. And uh, I was on Guadalcanal for only only a few days, it was only about 12 or 13 days that I was on Guadalcanal. Okay, now you're leading up to a confrontation with Japanese troops. Would you describe that with us, for us please, what happened there? Well, yes. When we moved up through the coconut grove, we found that there were some Japanese that were firing uh, sh shrapnel and they were tied themselves up to the top of the palm trees lashed themselves in with rope and they had a pedestal metal one that had a firing pin in it and then they had a tube that they placed over the firing pin and they were dropping grenades into that tube. They were rejected. The grenades landed near us and shrapnel was spread by the grenades so that there, there was a heavy firing of grenades from these Japanese who were in the trees. When we learned where they were coming from and we sprayed our rifle fire into the trees, we killed all of those Japanese up in the trees, and they were lashed in. And that, from that point on, we didn't have that type of fire to contend with. But as I mentioned, the Japanese that came around the promontory and landed further down, then they moved up toward our lines, and we faced each other, and that was the infantry combat that I was engaged in. Up to that point, had there been any briefing or any warning to you that uh, they had this particular um, weapon, that they would uh, shoot grenades, fire grenades out of the tops of palm trees? No, that was, was this a, a total surprise a total to surpri you? Total surprise for us. But it didn't take long to recognize where they were coming from, and therefore the soldiers, our soldiers, began firing their 
rifle bullets at the, at the top of yeah. all of the, all of the coconut trees, and that very quickly silenced that activity. Were you yourself injured in this particular attack? I was not injured in that attack. No. Okay. I was un uninjured at the time. But it was while we were facing the Japanese, and incidentally, they did not desire to fight in the daytime. They fought only at night. So that as soon as it became dark, we had to be extremely alert. And it so happened that I was laying with my head behind a palm tree. My rifle was in my left arm, left hand, and it was extended outside of the uh, tree. And some of the shrapnel went into my arm and it began to, to bleed. And Where did this shrapnel come from? It came from... Uh, this was a night attack by the Japanese? Yes, they, they were lobbing shells over. So you were struck by shrapnel? I was struck by shrapnel. There were two pieces of shrapnel that went into my left arm. And I was losing blood from that. Um, about a day and a half after I was hit, I knew the location of where the beach was, and I took it upon myself to crawl back toward the area where I, where I knew the beach was. And when I cleared the area and got onto the beach, it so happened that I was facing a landing ship, the United States landing ship that had come in from a ship that was anchored offshore. And they had come in to evacuate Navy personnel that had lost their ships at the battles that had occurred there. And I was motioned to get on that landing ship, and I was taken out to a ship that contained the Navy personnel that had lost their ships at the battles that were fought. I was supposed to get on the other ship that was at the beachhead. Incidentally, these two ships had come in to unload ammunition and some food supplies. And at nighttime, they went across to a small island opposite Guadalcanal where there was a harbor and they would retreat into the harbor and they had a chain link fence that they put across the entrance of the harbor to protect the ships that were inside the harbor at Tulagi. And then in the morning, they took the fence that was across the entrance to the harbor, and they left the harbor to come back to the beachhead. When I, when the ship I was on came out of the harbor, it had, the other ship had gone out before us. That ship was now at the beach and it was grounded at the beach because there was a big hole in its side. It had, I, we believe that there was a small Japanese submarine submerged at night waiting for the two ships to come back. And they put a hole in the ship that was taking the army soldiers away. So the ship that I was on immediately left the area and sailed south. Did the other ship sink as a result of this uh, the, uh, the, being I, torpedoed? I learned later that the other ship had to be beached there, mm -hmm. and it was left there. 
At Tulagi or Guadalcanal? At Guadalcanal. It had taken a, a torpedo, yeah. and it was taken in water. So just by chance, you got on a ship, you had one chance to get on a Navy ship or an Army ship. That one was torpedoed. Right, that's so yours left the area, and where, and where did you go? Well, I, I was on the ship with the Navy, and I was, I was supposed to transfer over to the ship with the Army fellows on, but that ship had been hit, struck, and beached, so I, there was no possibility of my going onto that ship, so I remained on the ship with the Navy personnel, and we headed south. Well, we continued to head south. We stopped at Bougainville, where I and four or five other fellows that had slight wounds uh, went ashore, and they didn't want to put their uh, X-ray machines on because they were afraid that would be detected by the Japanese. So they didn't. They decided they did not want to probe for the pieces of shrapnel because they didn't know where they were in my arm, and so they simply washed off my wound and they put a little bandage around it and gave me a sling, and I got back aboard the ship that I had left. Guadalcanal on, and that ship continued south. And it the, the first treatment you got was at Bougainville? At Bougainville. Was there none aboard ship? There was none aboard ship. So this was not in any sense a hospital ship? No, it was not. It was a supply no, ship no. that you left on? Right. Okay. Can you tell us that you've just described the treatment you got. Um, other men wounded with more severe wounds perhaps, what kind of medical treatment did they get and, and where did they get it? Well, I believe there was a medical unit attached to our regiment. Uh, there were so-called medics that would... Right there at Guadalcanal. Right there at Guadalcanal yeah. to service minor wounds. But of course, I, I left and got on to this particular ship so that I was not serviced by the medics that were with us. I was serviced by the medic that I mm -hmm. that were at Bougainville when we when we uh, pulled in there. Was there any I'll put this in quotes, any kind of a problem of your being an army guy and you wind up on a on a ship full of navy wounded and navy personnel? Did they treat you the same as the others? Exactly the same. It, was, it wasn't even noticeable that I was uh, um, They were Navy and Marines were aboard the ship I was on. After you left Bougainville, um, you continued south, you say? We continued south, and we went south to New Zealand. And the reason for that was the Navy person, the, the, the other ship would have gone back to New Caledonia, which where we came from. Mm -hmm. But the ship that I was on was naval. And the Navy had a hospital on New Zealand. And that hospital served the Navy. It was a permanent hospital in New Zealand. And that served the Navy for a specific fleet when it was out in the Pacific. And so Do that you remember where in New Zealand you were? Where this particular yeah. hospital was? Yes, I was first in Wellington, New Zealand. And I received some medical attention there, but it was uh, very minor. They had looked at my arm, and the, the doctor had uh, said, well, we'll just leave the metal in. 
that it was probably sterile when it went in, and as long as I could move my fingers and my hands, that they wouldn't take it out, anticipating that when I could get back to the States, if I ever did, they could there take x-rays and locate the, the uh, shrapnel in my arm and, and remove it safely. Is that what happened, that you then left New Zealand? No, I, I, when I was in New Zealand, I was ambulatory, and so I was sent to an embarkation point where the Anzac troops would gather before loading onto ships and going to North Africa, where they were fighting. The Anzac troops, Australian, New Zealand troops, were fighting Rommel's tank corps in North Africa at the time. And that's where their soldiers went. So I was in the embarkation place where they left from, and there was a a uh, 24-hour day cafeteria that was still running there, and there was a, a head man at the, at the camp. And uh, I met with him, and he asked, said to me, do you want to go back to join your uh, group up in the islands? And I said, no, I didn't want to go back. And so he acknowledged that. And after about a month and a half there, he did call me and sent me to Auckland, New Zealand. And there was a similar camp there that I went into. And there was a commandant there that this man had sent me to. That was, a, that was an overnight train ride to get to Auckland, New Zealand. And that man, when he called me, he said, there's a ship coming in and it's going to take you from here to San Francisco. So this large ship came and it came to take on water. They had just taken troops over to Australia, left the troops. And then they came back, they stopped in New Zealand to refresh their water supply. And I went aboard that ship and there were four other uh, army fellows who had similar experiences to mine that were also got on the ship. And that took us back to San Francisco. So that is how I get back to the States. And Can you go back to, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the logistics here that the Anzacs are being shipped over to North Africa while Americans and others are being shipped in the opposite direction to go to the chain of islands that eventually led to Japan. Um, can you tell us I guess the question is, you had a decision to make about going back to your own outfit or going back to a reassignment someplace else. D d um, were the well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that was an alternative. He, had, he simply asked the question, did you want to go back to join your... I see. And he was anticipating that if that was the case, maybe they could find a way to get me back. I see. But. Were the, the fellows that were with you uh, the same ones that had gotten on the ship at Guadalcanal, the, the Navy ship? I am not sure they were the same ones at all. Okay. No. Uh, 
the situation in the South Pacific was, was this, that in Australia and in New Zealand, there were not any able-bodied men between the ages of 18 and 46. All of them had been sent to North Africa to fight Rommel's tank corps. That's where their young men were. And as youngsters reached the age of 18, they were automatically shipped over to join those troops in North Africa. So that there were not any able-bodied men at all in Australia or New Zealand. And that would leave the populace very much vulnerable to being exactly right. conquered by Japanese soldiers if they could get to Melbourne, Sydney, and Auckland and Wellington. They would have complete, thorough control of the Pacific Ocean, which would then enable them to attack the west coast of the United States, which was not at all heavily fortified. So that keeping the Japanese occupied and away from Australia and New Zealand was of paramount importance to the interests of the United States. And that was Were there uh, other t um, nationals other than American troops there? Did, did you run into? No, there were none that I know of. British or French or any, any no. other? No. 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 There were none. And it's a huge territory to, to try and guard uh, coming down from Darwin or wherever yes. the Japanese but, but might have Fortunately, the only place that the Japanese had taken themselves to was Guadalcanal and the Solomons. That's as far as they got, and that's where they were met by the resistance by the United States, and that's exactly where we stopped them. Because after that, later I learned that the American troops began to capture other islands like Iwo Jima and others, names I don't know, working their way back up to the Philippines. I think the history of World War II, particularly in the Pacific, shows that Guadalcanal was the turning point. But that's as far, that's as far down as the, as the Japanese, Japanese came. They, they couldn't and lie. after that, they, they were sent home. Right, right. Where did you, you go to San, uh, San Francisco on a big ship. Yeah. What happened to you then? Well, I got off the ship and I went to Letterman General Hospital, which was the San Francisco permanent military hospital on the West Coast. And from there, I was sent to Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana, Indianapolis. And at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, As an aside, I sent for the young lady that I became engaged to before I in, left the United States. And we were married at the Post Chapel at Fort Benjamin Harrison. I was transferred from there to Camp Atterbury, also in Indiana. Indiana which was a limited, I was placed on limited duty there to act as instructor in military drill and instructor in the care, cleaning, and use of the M1 rifle to soldiers who were drafted in, I think that's the Third Corps area, who could neither read nor write. And the Army 
required that a soldier be able to read and write his own name, which these men couldn't. It was not for any mental disability on the part of these people. It was just that they came from West Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky and had never gone to school. So they therefore can neither read nor write. So they were assigned to this unit at Camp Atterbury to learn English to the extent that they could read and write it at least enough so that they could sign for their paychecks. And while they were there, I was on the military side of that to give them close out a drill out in the parade grounds and march them back and forth and uh, have them go through all of the marching maneuvers that take place. And in addition, to teach them about the care, cleaning, and use of the M1 rifle. And that was my responsibilities that I was assigned. I didn't ask you, uh, you got a Purple Heart as a result of your having been wounded, I will assume. Yes. Uh, where and when, or how was this presented to you as a wounded man coming back from that, combat? That was presented to me at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis. I and several other people were, on this one particular day, awarded the Purple Heart in a ceremony that was held at that fort. And fort Benjamin Harrison is a permanent army fort that is in Indiana. And that's where that was awarded to me. Okay. Aside from teaching these men the use of close order drill and the use of the Grand Rifle, you had been in combat. You had been at a place called Guadalcanal. What, was that experience, did the Army take advantage of that experience that you brought, that you had, you had been there and seen that? And for example, you had seen the, the uh, Japanese up in trees firing grenades at you. Did the Army take good use of that experience and so that you could talk to other men about that who were going to go into the same place you had been? Well, not to my knowledge. I don't know. I know that the Army did not in any way contact me for questioning about my experiences or learning what my experiences were or anything of that nature. I never had any such conversation with anyone who okay. would be assigned that task by the Army, no. You had quite a a time in the Army, and you joined the Army before most people did, you, you know, before Pearl Harbor. I had a low number. Can you think back, and is there a most memorable experience in your military career that you could tell us about today? Something that stands out above everything else? Yeah, it was standing on deck as we approached the bridge in San Francisco and continuing to stand on deck, just looking at that bridge as we went under it. And I think that was, that made me feel at home. Sailing under the Golden Gate and back into San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. How about a memorable character? Is there some person that you look back on this all the way back to 1942 or 43 in your service? No, I cannot think of anyone. I cannot think of where were you discharged? Or 
Was it in um, Indiana? Yes, I believe I was at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And I'll tell you, on a Sunday, I was staying in camp, the only one in my company. They needed somebody to be on duty in the office up at the head of our barracks. And I was the person that was selected to stay on duty this particular Sunday. And as I was there, there were the third core area out of Cincinnati has daily you might call them orders of things that were happening in the Third Corps area that were sent to all of the company commanders that are in the area. And they would have such thing as, uh, well, ordering of oil supplies and how to order something else and given simply daily comments about what was taking place in the core area. And those were kept in a book, added to every day, to be the publications that describe what was going on in that particular core area. And those were put into to book form in each company to be kept. Well, one came in, and there was a paragraph that I read I was, had nothing else to do. I was reading this pamphlet. It caught my eye. It said, a combat wounded, oh, it said an enlisted man, combat wounded overseas and placed on limited duty will be discharged at his own request. And I read that again. An enlisted man, combat wounded overseas, and placed on limited duty, will be discharged at his own request. And I said, here I am, I'm combat wounded. You fit the bill. Fit the bill. <laughs> so I closed the door of the company headquarters that I was sitting in. This was a Sunday. I went up to the uh, main headquarters of that camp, and there was an officer on duty, and I handed him this pamphlet, and I said, will you give me an interpretation of this paragraph, please? And he read it, and he looked at it, and he said, you come, listed man, combat wounded overseas, he has placed on limited to duty, maybe this is your own request, he says, read it. He says, I don't believe it, but I can read it. He says, I'll, I'll let you know. He says, I'll send it. I'll send a request. If you want to be discharged, he says, I'll send a request in. He sent the request in. Three days later, he called me up to, up to see him. And he said, you're going to be discharged on May 5, 1943. 43. And orders had gone through from the discharge. Back I go, and I told three or four of my buddies who were in the same position I was, I said, get yourself up to the, to the headquarters. And I'm getting out of the Army in, in a few days on May 5th. Go up there and get get your discharge. They went up, they saw the officer, he sent their names in, and his request was returned that the order had been rescinded. Now the only thing that I can understand, I can think of is that there was some individual that had the kind of clout necessary to encourage the Third Corps area to issue that daily order. 
and he had some individual that he wanted to get out of the service, and he did, and I slid out under the same documentation that he did, and then it was just rescinded. Somebody had enough authority to get that put through, and that's the only way I can explain it. But you got out. But I got out. You got out. Yeah. Did you go immediately back to where you were uh, enlisted? I immediately went back home. And you're married now. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I was married. Have you since uh, taken advantage of any of the uh, perks of having served in the military? Uh, did you use your GI Bill to continue your education? Yes, I used the GI Bill for uh, some additional location, additional education that I could. How about uh, a GI mortgage or hospitalization? A GI mortgage, I took advantage of that. Disability benefits? I have. 20% disability for scar tissue. So I have the, that scar tissue 20% disability payment. Mel, how important to you personally was serving in the military? What did it mean to you over your lifetime? Well, I've taken satisfaction in knowing that when I was called by my country, I responded, and I did so willingly. Nobody had to come and grab me and drag me away. I went, and I feel that was the only thing that I wanted to do. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to try and find somebody who had some influence to keep me out of the army or even think in that direction. So I, I always felt that I, I did the proper thing and it was what I wanted to do. And you were wounded in behalf of your country? In, in combat. Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't asked you this morning that you would like to make a, a part of this tape? No, because I still think that there are men, young men today, who are doing what I did, not necessarily because I did it, but there are young men even today who are going out, putting their life on the line, and are in danger to make sure that this country is protected. And I think that's what we did, and I'm very glad to know that there are young men doing the very same thing today. Melvin Davis, thank you very much for coming in today. You're Appreciate welcome. it very much.